talks, and uh, I didn't actually get to do any programming with anyone, and that is a, a regret. But now that this thing's about to be out of the way, I would really like to pair with some folks and like talk about things and just like hang out. Uh, I'm not going to be giving talks the whole time. Uh, tempting though it is. All right. So let's see. Uh, hash tables, right? So why are we doing hash tables? I gotta, I gotta make a small confession here. That, so here's what I was presented with by Ms. Vincent. Um, she said, "Why don't I talk for technical talks about 20 to 30 minutes long? They usually address something that made the speaker a better programmer. Uh, not a strict requirement, but we prefer talks that are more technical in nature. So I said, okay, well I can probably do that. Uh, and then I uh, started thinking, what is something?" that made me a better programmer, and the answer came instantly, uh, suffering. <laughs> uh, but it's no, it's not of a technical nature. So, okay, so I dumped that, and then the next idea came almost immediately afterwards. Oh, the perfect talk. I will talk about SICT, <laughs> um, which has had an immeasurable effect on my programming, and I spent like, Three years studying SICP and like absorbed as much as I could, and it's totally technical. Except that the three years was all between like 12 and 15 years ago, and although all that stuff's still in me, I don't remember anymore what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have had to go back to the book and reread it. So, oh yeah, this and this and this and this and this. I didn't have time, so we're not doing SICP today. Uh, and then then I started to scrape out the barrel, uh, and uh, so uh, oh yeah, this is really good actually. So this is like I write some code and then I say, oh man, this is this is so easy. I don't have to write tests for this. And then the little voice at the back of my head says, just write the test, fool! And, <laughs> I do it. and then, then I find seven bugs. <laughs> I had that little voice. So this is definitely made me a better programmer, but not technical enough. Uh, so let's see, what's next? Uh, this, uh, Unix. Unix, the tools approach, and like just the fact that Unix supports me constantly in a million ways every day, <coughs> but uh, everybody already uses Unix, and so and it is technical enough, but you don't want to hear it because you already do it. So, uh, and then let's see, what was, uh, <laughs> not technical enough. <laughs> So then finally, all oh, right, with like a few days to spare, yes, we are going to talk about hashes, um, which are uh, in some times they're known as associative arrays. Uh, Python calls them dictionaries. Perl calls them hashes. Actually, Perl originally called them associative arrays also. Then like someone got a brainwave about 15 years ago. You know what? That makes it sound complicated and obscure. Let's give it a short, simple name, and then it'll sound simple and important. Uh, and also, when we talk about it with each other, we won't have a little just open the word either. It's half, okay. Um, the idea is actually, so these are, became prevalent in languages, I guess, it was, it was a slow, slow rise, but roughly around the late 80s, maybe, but, um, but their idea is actually a lot older. Um, early sightings, uh, so the, the idea is you, the associative data structures, list has these things called property lists. Uh, I have not been able to figure out when these were first introduced, but they are ancient, and I'm guessing uh, around 1960. Um, this language, Snowball, uh, which uh, stands, I don't remember what it stands for, but the, the name is, it's a joke on COBOL. It has nothing to do with COBOL, it's just a joke. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't worry. Um, the S is for string, because it's good at manipulating strings, and like back in the 1960s, you didn't have languages, you had list-oriented list languages, string-oriented languages, math-oriented languages, now they all have to do everything. Um, so glad we left that behind. Uh, but Snowball is really, really good at strings, especially for 1965. We're going to see more of that later. Uh, Auth, I think, is the big breakthrough here. It had this feature called associative arrays, which are in every spec, just like half, uh, Python dictionaries or Perl hashes uh, in 1977. Uh, and uh, unlike these similar sorts of things, it was actually implemented with hash tables, which I will discuss. Uh, there was a language called Rex, uh, which was actually meant Rex. I'm really curious. Yeah, all right. <laughs> it, was, it ran on a, uh, OS, uh, an IBM OS 370 uh, system called a CMS. Uh, and then, it, with the death of mainframes, it had a new life as the scripting language for the Amiga personal computer, of all things. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, it, it was, there's, there was sort of, uh, sort of like this, but a little bit broken because the person who did this was kind of a weirdo. 
Uh, and then for a while, Python come on the scene in the late 80s, early 90s, and that's when the idea really reaches its full flowering. So the basic idea, what's an associative data structure? <laughs> So what's an associative data structure? Well, an array, of course, you have a bunch of data, and you want to access it using a numeric index. So we've got some index, say 23, and we store Margaret Hamilton in this array A under the index 23, and then later on we ask, well, what's element 23 in this array? And it prints out Margaret Hamilton. Cool, right, everybody's seen this. Uh, associative data structure, like a hash, uh, is just the same. Except the index doesn't have to be a number, it can be an arbitrary string. So here we've got a string, which is Hamilton, we're going to use as the key. And we'll say, okay, set, uh, associate Margaret with the string S, which is Hamilton. And then later on, we ask, well, what's associated with Hamilton? Oh, it's Margaret. Okay, that's an associative data structure, often called a hash. <coughs> to ask for questions, that's awesome. Uh, but if I say something that is utterly confusing and like giant purple question marks are shooting out of your head, just like, do stop me, fix it. Uh, all right, so the key is almost always some kind of string. Um, some languages manage to make these associative data structures that the index doesn't have to be a string, it can be like an arbitrary object or a pointer or a function, anything. Uh, and the way that works is that behind the scenes, they are taking your non-string and somehow turning it into a string, which they then use as a string. Uh, that's funny. Uh, right? And that's not actually that hard to do because everything that's stored in the computer is in fact a string. Uh, in one way or another, you just have to look at the, like, the bits of something and go, oh, hey, look, it's a string. Um, that's, that's the way computer memory works still. Um, so uh, from now on, we're just going to say, okay, it's all strings because that's really what's going on uh, under the covers. All right. Uh, basic string operations. I expect most people are familiar with this, so we're going to zip through it as quickly as possible. You can store uh, a pair, a key value pair, into a hash. You say, okay, I want to store it to this hash. Here's the key. Here's the value I want to associate with it. It looks for that key in the hash, uh, in, the, in, the, in the structure. Uh, and if it finds it, it replaces the value that's already stored with the new value. And if it doesn't find it, it adds a new key value association to the hash. Uh, the syntax, of course, is different in every language. Um, but, you know, uh, then once you've stored it, you can fetch it back. You say, okay, I want to look at this hash for the thing associated with this key. You know, it finds it, it gives you the corresponding value that you stored earlier, and if not, you get some kind of null or failure. Uh, again, details vary by language. Uh, here's where it starts to diverge from arrays. There's a contains. So okay, does this hash contain an association for key? This doesn't even make sense for arrays. It would be like asking, oh, is uh, this array of 57 elements, does it have an element 33? Like, well, yeah, always, because the numbers from 1, 0 to 56, 33 is in there. You don't have to ask. Just know that's the guess now. Right, so the contains is going to return a true or false value. True if the key is in there associated with something false if it's not. And then, uh, again, <coughs> there's a typically some kind of function like keys that gives you back a list of all the keys. Again, not something you ever need to do with an array because don't need a list of the numbers from 0 to 56, you just count. Uh, but here, keys might be in there, might not be. If you didn't put Smith in as a key, it's not there. And then uh, sometimes languages extend this with a first key and the next key. Some way to turn this uh, into an iterator so it doesn't return, like if your hash has a billion keys in it, it doesn't return a list of a billion things uh, and use up all your memory and then the system crashes and then like the city blows up and everybody has to put loop in putts. Uh, so instead, you use first key and next key to iterate through the keys one at a time. Well, let's do one second. I don't even know if we need to do this. Uh, look at Python, it looks like this. The thing is called a dictionary. You use square brackets, put the key in square brackets, that's a store. Say, if the value is now associated with this key. When you fetch it back, you say, oh, well, I want to get this and test it. Uh, in Perl, it looks like this. You declare that hash up front, it's called hash, curly braces. Variables in Perl always start with dollar signs. Store is the same, fetch is the same. Everybody cool? And then uh, Chris said I should fix this illustration, but it's, uh, she's saying, what do you mean Perl has too much punctuation? <laughs> First used this picture on a um, slide about 
pure computer science discussing Rice's theorem, which says that there's no property of a computer program that you can possibly calculate just from looking at the source, unless it's a trivial property that's always true or always false. You want to know, like, is this a function for calculating square roots? Too bad. You want to know, does this function halt on a given input? Too bad. You want to know, does this function commit an out-of-bounds array access? Too bad. Well, there she is telling you her theorem says, too bad. <laughs> All right. I just used up one tenth of my time. <laughs> 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 All right. Hashes are epochal. Like, if you grew up without, if you grew up without them, you cannot imagine how terrible things are before, before we have them. It's like totally changed everything. Not by, sorry, I'm speechless with awe here. All right, Alfred North Whitehead said that civilization advances by extending the number of operations that we can perform without thinking about it. And that is totally what hashes do. They take stuff that's complicated and multi-step and tricky to implement, and they make it trivial. And so here is just one of a billion examples. Here's a piece of blog software. And it's got a callback called Handle Article. When it's putting together a web page with 17 articles, this gets called 17 times. With the paths to the files that contain each article, and the category that each article is in, whether it's math or science or kids or whatever, and then the actual text of the article itself so it can be assembled into the web page. And it does a whole bunch of stuff here to build up the web page from templates or whatever and then publish it. And then we want to go and we want to add code to this so that it also generates a count of the number of articles in each category so that we can make a cute tag cloud and nobody knows what it means. <laughs> And if you were to do this in C or Fortran or some ancient language, it's a huge pain in the butt. Uh, and we're going to see later what you have to do to get this done in C. It's possible, it's just a pain. Right? But if you've got associative data structures, hashes, or even one of the precursors of hashes, all you have to do is this. You allocate the hash, we'll call it category count, it's going to associate categories with counts. And then, each time you handle an article, say, oh, look up the count, for this category and increment it. And that's it. <coughs> it's trivial. Holy cow. That's all you have to do. Well, actually, I think this, this has a bug. Uh, not, I didn't, it's actually, I take it back. It's not a bug. It works great. Uh, but there is a feature uh, that it requires that I didn't describe to you yet, <laughs> which is, <coughs> oops, it turns out the counts that come out of this are wrong because I didn't tell you yet, because handle article might be. The blog software might be manufacturing 12 different pages, and some of those pages have the same article on them, and those articles get counted twice, once for each page on which they appear, and so the category counts are off. Everybody okay with this? Yeah. Right. So, uh-oh, well, how do we fix that bug? Uh, that's a head scratcher. Oh, I know, we'll use another hash. <laughs> we'll have a hash called scene, and we'll say, oh, uh, if we haven't seen the article with this unique path yet, then increment the category count and make a note that we now have seen it, and next time we see it, we don't have to count it again. Awesome. All right, so how did we do this before hashes became common in languages? Probably the easiest thing you can do is a linked list, uh, because linked lists are, are maybe the simplest non-trivial data structure. Now I guess arrays, so linked lists are really simple. Um, so here's one idea. We'll have these nodes here, each of which has a space for a key, a space for the associated value, and a space for a pointer to the next node. And then we can implement this. This is pseudocode, but it would be really easy to translate this into C. Here's our implementation of contains, which returns a Boolean. Our, uh, sorry, our contains is going to be a little bit better. Um, it's going to, it's a, uh, uh, sorry, I'm about to digress. I'm going to stop. Ah, all right. All right. So you give it, uh, you can see this will be a pointer to the, head node of the list and the key you're looking for. <laughs> uh, and we're going to loop as long as that pointer still actually refers to a node and until we find the key we're looking for in the current node. Uh, and uh, if, um, if both of those are true, we're still looking at a node and if the key isn't the right one, okay, we'll say, all right, forget the current node, think about the next node instead. We'll move to the next node. And that's going to keep happening until one of two things happens. Either a soft list becomes empty, uh, becomes null, because we got to the end of the list and we didn't find a key, or 
we did find the node with the right key. And in that case, well, if ASOC list is null, we return null, indicating a failure of uh, that the key is not in this structure. And if we did find it, then ASOC list is pointing at that node, and so we return a pointer to that node. And hey, here's, oh, you asked for key Hamilton? Here's your node, Hamilton Margaret. Okay. And once we've got that, get and store are really easy. So get says, okay, we'll ask if, uh, if the association list contains the key we are looking for. Uh, and then if it does, we will return the value out of that node, the associated value, and if not, we'll return null. Uh, and store, store is a little tricky. You have to pass something by reference because we're actually going to have to modify the association list here given the event that we need to add a new key value pair to the structure. So this is by reference. Give it a key and a value. Again, it looks to see, okay, is the key in there? And if it is, then great. You take that node that we just got, which already has a value stored, and we replace it with the new value. And if not, then uh, we allocate a new node. We set the new node's next pointer to point to the head of the old list. So we link it onto the front of the list. And then we say, oh, and the list is now starts at this node, not the node it was starting at before. And that's so simple that you can even do it in C. And there's not a lot of things you can say that about. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Is there any more of this? Oh, yeah, you can even do it in Fortran if you're really, really dedicated. Um, this is the world's first Fortran programmer. <laughs> I get to say that because I actually held a job as a professional Fortran programmer once. Uh, at this point, I was expecting somebody in the audience to shout out, oh, I like Fortran. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I'm glad it made many things possible. Yes. <laughs> That's Simona? Yeah, hi. Hi. <laughs> So it's funny, I can't recognize people's faces very well. I often, like, people I know, like, come up to me and they're like, hey, right? and I don't know who they are. Who's this person walking toward me? And then they speak, and then suddenly, oh! <laughs> I recognize the voice. Uh, it's weird. It's a weird place to be. Not actually troublesome that much, but strange. Uh, all right. So lists had, uh, we, we call them associate ASOC lists, uh, or uh, sometimes P lists for P for property. Um, that were very much like this since, I again, I, I was not able to find out since exactly when, but it is real old. Uh, they structure them a little differently. Instead of a single node carrying a key and a value, each node carries a key or a value. And so when you find the key you're looking for, then you just return the next node, and that's the corresponding value. Uh, and this is really easy to do in list. List. Uh, the syntax is kind of funny. Well, the get, this shows you how old it was. That it, like, it was a list function that's not get property list association value. <laughs> <laughs> it's called get. Uh, you get a, uh, properties are associated with symbols in list. Uh, every symbol has a property list. And then uh, for storing, uh, you use this funny setf thing, which is actually one of the really nice features of list, which is that you can give it anything that gets anything. And then you just plug that into edit, set up, and that means, oh, figure out where that thing would have been gotten from, and instead of getting it, change it to that, um, which, is, which is awesome. I can probably give a decent talk just about, about why that's cool, uh, but not today. All right. So the big drawback of uh, association lists is they run in all event time. Uh, if you have a failed lookup, you have to search the entire list, all n elements, one at a time. And even a successful search takes uh, around n half time because you, on average, have to search half the list. Uh, and then, so, to uh, insert n items into an association list takes quadratic time, which is unacceptable unless you've got very few items. Uh, so how to fix this? And one answer is, oh, we'll just use trees. Uh, we can, you know, insert the stuff in sorted order. That way it's, uh, it takes log n time to do a fetch or a store to find the thing you're looking for. Uh, unless you hit the worst case behavior for the tree, and like say for example you're inserting a million items into the tree and they are arriving in alphabetical or reverse alphabetical order and your tree then doesn't come out all bushy and leafy the way it's supposed to, it comes out as a long thing, as a list claiming to be a tree. Like someone trying to sneak into a bar when they're underage. I'm a tree, I'm a tree. You're a list, get out of here kid. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, the worst case behavior here is very common. It's really typical to oh, get a whole bunch of items that happen to have been sorted already. And then, bang. All right. So uh, you show a programmer a problem, and they are so happy because programmers love to solve problems. And they, I can solve that problem, and then they solve it, and they're like, yeah, but now you've got another problem. I can solve that one too. And they'll go on solving problems all day. 
57 of which are the ones that they made solving the first 56. Uh, and so now we have a very brief hope, excursion into what happens when you try to solve this worst case problem of list of trees. Uh, well, you have uh, two, three trees, which are a way of getting the elements. If the one side gets too heavy, the elements kind of percolate up and try to balance out the. Cool. Well, we're in good shape here. Balance out the <laughs> uh, And then there's red black trees, which is when you do two, three trees, but three is too high to count. And you're trying to pretend that it's a two, three tree, even though it's only a two tree. Uh, and then you've got what is my absolute least favorite data structure in the entire world the AVL balancing tree. Because let's look at it. <laughs> What is this good for? Well, it's good for tormenting undergraduates who are taking data structures. And aside from that, it is totally worthless. Who <laughs> <laughs> even uses this? I've known people to use this, and it was always like, okay, well, why didn't you use a hash? And they're like, oh. <laughs> hash tables have better average time behavior. They have the same worst case behavior. A hash can go terribly wrong and end up with O of N seek and store time, but the worst case behavior is extremely rare, and unlike a tree, it only occurs extremely randomly. You can't, unless you know like all the details of the hash ahead of time, you cannot construct any particular input that will cause the hash to have worst case behavior. You just have to hit the lottery of bad luck. And you know, it doesn't happen that often because you don't hit the lottery that often. Whereas with a tree, sorted input will break it. And the algorithms are really simple, unlike, say, well, never mind. <laughs> so here's the map. Right? Oh, one like this. Right. Okay. And this is only half of it. The other half is just as bad, but on the other side. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's see. Where are we? All right. So before we get into how the hash actually works, I'm going to describe this thing from Snowball, because I promise, and because it's so awesome. Snowball is a really bizarre language. It's uh, 1962 to 1967-ish. And it was a very forward-looking language at the time. There are Parts of Snowball, like, okay, but the thing is, it, it's really like it was totally the language of the future, but it's a future that we're not in. <laughs> <laughs> and so you go back and you look at Snowball, and you're like, wow, this is amazing, and totally different from everything I've seen before. And it does, and in some ways, it's hopelessly 1965. Like it only like control structures. It doesn't happen. It has go to. Um, and they just like didn't come up with any. Oh, actually, that's not true. It has really good subroutines. It has recursive subroutines, which, believe it or not, were unusual in 1965. Uh, and were like a great thing. Um, okay, so uh, Snowball, which I uh, reiterate, does not have anything to do with COBOL, uh, except as a joke. Uh, it has these associative structures called tables. They are not based on hashes, but the Snowball people made a decision not to use hashes there. Because <clears throat> here's the weirdest thing about Snowball. It's really good for manipulating strings. Each string in a Snowball program is unique. If you construct the string Hamilton in one place, and then somewhere else you construct the identical string Hamilton in some completely other place, they are represented in the program as pointers to the exact same object representing the string Hamilton. And how does it manage that? It has an enormous hash table with an entry for every single string that as actually exists in the program at any point. Um, and associated with that is a structure, actually a variable structure, because you can have a variable with that name. And so if you have a variable called T or a variable called word, those are strings also. And there's an entry in this giant hash table with word pointing to the variable that contains the value of the word variable. And T containing a pointer to the variable structure that contains this table. And Hamilton is a string, and there's an entry there, and it points to a structure, totally unique structure, that contains nothing because you don't have a variable called Hamilton. But you could, and you might. And so one of the things you could do in Snowball that was unusual is say, okay, I want to assign to a variable, and the name of the variable is in variable x. Um, and it was really easy, just follow two pointers. So here, we've got Hamilton, and you know, this when you construct this Hamilton and put it into Word, Word ends up, it gets a pointer to the same structure that is used for this word. Uh, and uh, this is how you print something out in Snowball. You assign it to the special variable output. I don't even know how that's handled. <laughs> anyway, so there's these tables things. These are associative structures, and this is the key, and that's the value. And so when we insert Margaret Hamilton into this table, when we insert Margaret Hamilton into this table, it looks at an enormous hash table, which is not depicted here, and it finds the pointer to the unique Hamilton structure. That's this. 
and it installs that pointer in here in your table. The table is like an array with two columns, keys and values. And then the value is Margaret, so it finds or creates a unique Margaret object, and it installs a pointer to Margaret. Now we're going to go and insert Hamilton Fish. He was uh, uh, governor of New York uh, before Cuomo. Uh, and so Hamilton Fish, so it finds or creates a fish structure and installs the pointer to that. Then it finds Hamilton, and it says, oh, we've already got a Hamilton object, and it installs a pointer to Hamilton. Now what if you mutate one of these strings? You can't mutate strings in COBOL, but it will manufacture a new mutated string object and install that in the hash table. And then let's see, let's do Margaret Mead. It finds, uh, well in this case it's going to create Mead and install a pointer, and then it's going to find Margaret in the enormous hash table of every string in the program, and it's going to find this one, and it's going to install a pointer to it. Okay, why is this good? It's weird, but why is it good? Well, you want to search the table to find out if it has the key Mead. How does it do that? Does linear search on the left-hand column. But wait, that's O of N. But it's a really fast O of N because it all ha only has to do a single pointer comparison. So this, it knows you're looking for me and it has a pointer to this thing. Is this that pointer? No. No? Ah, yes. So it's like one instruction. So it is lightning fast. Although it doesn't scale, but that's okay because computers in 1965 didn't have that much memory. <laughs> So it was really clever. It was a really good engineering trade-off. All right, how much time do I have? Five? All right. All right. So here's how hashes work. I promise this. I think we're going to run over by more than I said. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody's cool staying here till 8.50 right now. <laughs> All right. So here we've got some dictionary or hash object. We're going to associate Margaret with Hamilton. Here's how the hash works. Uh, you take the string Hamilton and you map it to an array index. You have an array, it's got some number of array elements. We're going to say 16. So you need to map this somehow to a number between 0 and 15. And I will describe later how this works. Oh man, it's not here. All right. All right. So then, what do we do with the 9? Then you take the key and the value and you store them into slot number 9 of your 15 to 16 element array. And uh, if you're clever, okay, I'll explain this thing later. Right. So you've got Hamilton Margaret and uh, Hey, that's constant time, because this computation is constant time. And then looking up an element in an array, or setting it, is constant time, right? It's a single multiplication, an addition, and then a write. So it's constant time. Well, um, well, actually, sir, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll fix it later. Yeah. I'm allowed to do that it's, it's to myself, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. I was afraid I was violating the <laughs> oh, yeah, the box, right? <laughs> okay, so three obvious problems here, possibly some less obvious problems. First, I said that a miracle occurs. How do you map a hash key, a string, to an array index? That's number one. Number two, all right, well, you've got only 16 array elements, and I think there's more than 16 strings, so what's going to happen? when you map two strings to the same array index, as you inevitably will, right? You put Margaret Hamilton in there, and then every time you insert something new into the hash, you've got a 1 in 16 chance of hitting Margaret Hamilton. And, okay, well, what do you do? And, and finally, what happens when the array fills up? So, three interesting questions. There are many answers to these. None of them very difficult. Uh, and there are, so let's see. So David Albert, when I told him I was talking about hashing, he's like, oh my, that's great, because I would really <laughs> love to know how hash functions work. It's like, like, it's like mysterious sorcery. I don't know how this could possibly work. People do all this weird stuff. All right, fine. I, I was going to reveal, I was going to do the big reveal today, who's now not here. Uh, but <laughs> I realized, yeah, it is really complicated. I really don't want to get into the details. And then I realized, oh my god, I can actually tell you the whole story on one slide. So here it is. Um, so suppose the array has n slots and then you're trying to figure out where key K should go. Here you go. You take a pseudo-random number generator, and you seed it with K, right? Because it's a string, so it can be turned into a number. You can like feed the bytes into the random number generator one at a time, or something like that, four at a time, something like that, right? Uh, and having seeded the random number generator, you then extract a random number from it. And let's call that R. And then you take R mod N, which reduces it uniformly to some number between 0 and n minus 1, suitable for an array index. That's i, and then there you go. And that's it. That is the 
big secret. And the, the theorem, this is like, like mathematical theorem, like so we, we really know, <laughs> that if you don't know anything ahead of time about what the keys are going to be like, then this process is random. If the random number generator is sufficiently random, if it's actually random, this gives you the best possible performance. And all the weird tinkering and sneaking around and dark sorcery and stuff that people do with like tweaking the hash function and like they're trying to get this just so is because they think they know what the keys are going to be and they're trying to optimize for that. And whether they do actually knows what the keys are or not, they spend a lot of effort on it. So, um, but this is this is the idea. You know, the, 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 in one line, the answer is you pick a repeatable but random index and you put it there. Um, the study of what happens when you put stuff at random into a bunch of numbered bins, and like, because you would not expect if you put 16 things into 16 bins at random that they're all going to go into one each, right? On average, they're one each. But some of the bins get missed, some of the bins get lucky and get like a few in them, right? So there's this like whole mathematical set of mathematical problems called the balls and bins problem that says, okay, well, if I put 16 things into 16 bins, how many, what's the maximum load it's called? How many, how many things are going to be in the most full bin? How many bins are going to be empty on average? Uh, there's a lot of work done on this. It's really interesting. Uh, and just a bit of jargon here. When you're trying to put two things in the same bin, two key value pairs in the same array slot, it's called a collision. Uh, and the array slots are called buckets because you're putting balls in the buckets. <coughs> so let's see, where are we? 30? Yeah, okay. So uh, I think I got like six slides left. Five slides left. All right. Uh, so here's, here's how Perl handles collisions. Um, here's the array buckets. And Perl doesn't put a single key value pair into the bucket. It has linked lists of buckets. So you store Hamilton, Margaret in here, and then we store Hao Wan here, and then Rosalind Franklin collides with Hao Wan. That's OK. Oh, actually, this means that Franklin was in first, because then we stick Hao Wan at the beginning. Right, at the beginning of the list. You don't want to go to the end of the list. That's a waste of time. Again, also, that way you're more likely to look up keys that you put in recently, maybe, because you dealt with them recently, so those are the ones you want to look for first, so everything works out. Right? Three, four, five. Here we got another collision. There's two here, and there's a bunch of extras at the end here. I didn't want to put the picture. 15 still empty. Um, the uh, drawback, of course, is the worst case behavior is now O of n again. But to get that, you have to have nearly all the keys in one bucket. And since you're selecting the locations for the keys at random, you're selecting the buckets at random, this is extremely unlikely. And unlike the tree, there is no particular set of obvious patterns to the input that could possibly produce this because you're selecting them at random. So the typical and by far the most common behavior is that these things are all relatively short of length about log n. And so the fetch and store time is O of log n. So that's my well, actually, for this. All right. Let's see. I forget what comes next here. Let's see. Oh, what happens when you fill up the array? We're going to continue with Perl for a while before moving on to Python. So when you fill up the array, at some point, Perl sees that the lists are getting long. And it decides, OK, um, we need to do something about this. It's actually quite simple. Um, we had 16 slots. It, allocates a new array with twice as many slots, 32 slots, and then it basically rebuilds the entire table. It goes through each one of these keys. Okay, Hamilton, I'm going to rehash Hamilton. What's the hash value? Oh, the hash value was mod, mod 16 was 0. Mod 32, it's also 0. We'll put her here. All right, what happens to how long? Well, his hash value mod 16 was 2. Mod 32, it's also 2, so we'll put it here. What happens to Rosalind Franklin? Her hash value mod 16 was 2, but mod 32 is 18. So we put her in a different bucket. And then like the other ones down here, right, Big Bird stays in the same place, Dick Feynman goes into 18. So right, each of these gets split between two buckets and therefore decreases by about half. And suddenly the lists are all half as long. Uh, these guys ended up, uh, Leonard Euler and Quincy Jones ended up in slide 30. Uh, both of them, 14 was empty. Uh, and so earlier I had this picture I said I'd explain later where there's like a little number hanging down from Margaret Hamilton. That's her hash value. No point in recomputing that. 142857 or something. No point in recomputing that. Just store that along with this, and that way when you rebuild the hash, you don't have to do the random number generator thing again. You just take the 142857 mod 32, which is a single instruction, 
right? It's just an AND operation. Uh, and then you know exactly where she wants to go to go when you rebuild the table. Rebuilding the table is expensive. You have to go over every single key and redistribute it. But here, it only happens, the table doubles in size each time. So you only have to do it log n times. And if you add up how many reallocations like this you have to do, well, the, the last one has to reallocate all of them, say n. And the one before that, well, it's only half as big, so you reallocate it when they're only half as many, so it's n over 2. And the one before that was only n over 4. And the one before that was n over 8, and that adds up to 2n. So it takes linear time and overall to do all of these reallocations, and the amount of time per key is constant. A constant amount of time per node to do all this reorganizing, so it's cheap. <clears throat> Python handles collisions in a completely different way. Uh, it has an array, and the array slot can contain a key and a value. And say Hamilton uh, hashes to zero, so we put in Hamilton and Margaret. And then we put in the Wang hashes to two, so we put in Wang uh, Long. And then Rosalind Franklin also hashes to two, but that slot's full. So it just goes and it puts her in the next empty slot. And then somebody else ends up in slot four, and five, six, seven, eight, and the nine is empty again. We go put in Leonard Euler, and he goes in slot 14, and Quincy Jones goes in slot 15 because he wanted to go in 14, but that's full, so we put Jones in the next empty slot. Uh, and then when you're going to look something up, say we're looking up Rosalind Franklin, okay? You hash Franklin, and uh, you find that the index is two, you go there, and uh, you don't compare the strings at this point, right? We have the hash values stored, so we can just compare that with a single integer compare and see if this person's hash value before the mod is equal to the one we're expecting for Franklin, and it's not. So we go to the next one, ah, there she is. Or if we're looking for somebody who's not in there, like maybe something hashes to eight, check eight, that's not it. Oh, nine is empty, then we give up. We know it's not there at all. <laughs> so you give up when you get to an empty slot. If we were trying to look for somebody who hashes to 14, but it's not Euler or Jones, we check this, we check this, we check this, and then, oh, it's empty, we give up. Um, so the worst case lookup time here is also O of n, because if this table got really full, you could like end up at a really long run of keys that are in there and, uh, and have to look at all of them before you finally hit the empty slot. But if the hash table is not too full, that does not happen. The hash table is only half full, then on average, every second slot is empty. And if you're looking at slots looking for an empty one, you will only see two full ones before the next empty one. So a failed search takes three, and a successful search takes at most two. That's if the table is half full. So it's important not to let the table fill up too much. And when the table gets too full, Python does what? Uh, it doubles the number of buckets and rebuilds it, just like Perl does. Uh, deletion in Perl is really simple. You find the linked list that contains the thing you want, and you delete. Easy. Uh, and then there's a really <laughs> special case when the list is empty or something. I mean, you have to actually put all what's in the bucket. Uh, Python's a little funnier. So if you want to delete how long here, uh, and you can't just leave this empty. Because if you did, then when you went to look up Hamilton, you'd look here first, it would be empty, and you'd say no. So instead, Python replaces it with a thing called a tombstone that says this thing's been deleted, but it's not empty. Then when you come looking for Franklin, you come in here, okay, well, this is a tombstone, it doesn't count. Look at the next slot just like you would, and oh, there she is. And then, oh, sorry, yes? Is there any advantage of using that? Questions for the end. Okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, and uh, let's see, oh, when you double the size of the, that's the thing. That's just like, that's the rule, Zach says so. You gotta follow Zach's orders. All right. When you, uh, when you rehash and you like double the size of the table, Doing all this stuff, you can of course skip the tombstones because they're gone and you just delete them now. All right, I think that's the end of my talk. Thank you very, very much. We will have a two minute break followed by questions. Cool, yeah, everyone. I'm Nicola, and I'm wondering why will Python not let me change the change a dictionary while I'm iterating through it? Oh, 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 so that's a really interesting question. Um, let me think, how does Python do the iteration? Hold on a minute, let me think about this a second. Um, so yeah, so there's this, there's this strange issue with, um, say you're iterating over the keys one at a time, right? And the way that's gonna be implemented is there's gonna be some kind of pointer or index or something that's keeping track of where you are now. 
Python, I imagine it's an index and it just starts with slot zero and like works its way through. Um, so suppose you insert a new key. Okay, and now your hash table is full and it doubles the number of buckets and rearranges everything. And then you continue your iteration from key number 57 or whatever. Well, you're going to skip some because they got uh, hashed out of uh, out from in front of you, and you're going to hit some twice because they got hashed into in front of you. And so you're not it's, you're going to lose the guarantee that the iteration hits each index exactly once. Follow up question: What if you were just like trying to pop something out of it? Couldn't it just replace it with two tombstones if it were rebuilding the queue? Um, <coughs> <laughs> No, well, I'm sorry. Uh, no, if, if I take it back, it's not true. If you add stuff to the to a Perl hash, uh, you are not guaranteed to get the correct results. Uh, you are allowed to delete. Okay. Uh, and I believe I would imagine Python would work also. You could delete while you're iterating. There, no? Does it like die while you're doing it, or that's that's so Fredo van Rossum. Okay. So, <laughs> right. So Perl. Perl actually uh, had a prohibition in the manual that said you may not modify the hash in any way while you're iterating. And I was in the hash code many, many years ago, and I discovered that deleting is safe. And not only is it safe, but it's safe because when Larry Wall wrote that code back in 1994, uh, he took extra pains to get that case right so that you could safely delete from a hash. Because well, that's a really useful thing to do. Okay, I want to iterate over all the keys of the hash and delete all the ones that match a pattern. Right? Um, so Larry Wall actually got that right, and then some, some knucklehead came later and wrote it in the manual, you can't do this, it might not work, and no, you're wrong, it works, and let me scrub the manual, and now it says, oh, you can delete. Uh, I would think that, that Python could work, because as you pointed out, all it has to do is put in a tombstone, and then later, if you hit the tombstone while you're iterating, that's okay, it was going to skip it anyway, right? But, you know, that's that's up for you, that's really what he's like. <laughs> if you bought into this language, you know, you bought into his philosophy, and so you can't say you didn't know what was coming. <laughs> All right, so that was too long. Who has another question? It's not so long. Okay, we got Nikki over here. When you're talking about how Snowball stores every string in a hash table, it's making me think of how, like, are we similar to how in Python, like, literally everything's eventually stored in a dictionary? Huh. Okay. That makes sense. Um, except that this is at one time. Uh, so when you construct a string at runtime, it gets stored in this mega hash. Uh, I don't even know if Snowball is compiled. It may be purely interpreted. Uh, did I miss the point of your question? Oh, I mean, like Python does that too, but it goes even further. Like, oh. if you make a variable in Python, it will be in the local namespace, which is just a dictionary. Yeah, but if you if you have uh, if you if you say a equals the string Hamilton, b equals the string Hamilton, they are not going to end up pointing to the identical string Hamilton, are they? Uh, they're going to point to two no. different objects that both happen to contain Hamilton. <coughs> yeah. Snowball, they will end up pointing to the same one and only Hamilton. All right. Who else has a question? Sumana would be. There you go. Oh, oh, no. Does Python have any? It seems a bit inefficient not you know, not being able to remove the two things because just fiddling around with the dictionary, I guess, means you have to keep something inside. Just fiddling now. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of clear well, reason that you can't do the same thing? What is the mentality behind not getting rid of two steps? I don't know. Uh, oh, well, you can't. I mean, yeah, you could, you could run over the hash and compact out between stones, and I don't know that it doesn't do that. Um, no, actually, that would be kind of a pain because. Does garbage collection get involved in this? Is what I was thinking. I don't know. Well, I'm you, not sorry, I don't know. You can overwrite it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, certainly. Right. I should have mentioned that, actually. So we deleted how long, right? And then we had gone and inserted somebody who needs to go into slot two. They would have overwritten that tombstone. Yes, thank you. Pinsky? Hi. Okay, see, there it is again. I recognize the voice, but not the face. All right, yes? Um, I'm just wondering, why wouldn't you allocate a new hash with a nested hash when you get a collision, as opposed to doing a more complicated look like that? Uh, Put in a pointer to another, I don't understand, to another hash table? Yeah. It sounds really complicated. <laughs> it sounds way more complicated than the Tombstone thing. I, 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 I don't understand what your idea is, so maybe we should talk about this some other time. Like, you're going to end up with like a tree of hashes. You're going to have to search down the tree of hashes 
and if the allocation goes wrong, then the tree of hashes turns into a linked list of hashes. And they assume you through a linked <laughs> list of really complicated, big structures instead of little teeny list nodes. That's, that's the first thing that comes to mind. All right. Yes? Uh, with 16 buckets, actually, like, is that the number that it always starts with? Uh, I don't know what Python does. Perl always starts with 8. Uh, unless there's actually there's a way to say, I want a hash, and I want you to prepare it with this, buckets, with this many buckets. And it rounds it up to the nearest power of 2. Uh, and you can do that if you, if you know ahead of time that you're going um, you know, to be inserting a million keys. You may as well pre-allocate it with you know, 2 to the 20 buckets. Um, not much often done because the reallocation really just doesn't cost that much. Cool. Yeah. All right. Was there someone other than Sumana who had a first question? I have one. Yes. So I believe in slide 31, you uh, were talking about operations on the table being log in. <coughs> Do you remember this? I'm sorry. Please say that again. Slide 31. Yeah. Could, could you? Yeah, we can go to slide 31. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Let's do that. Hold on. Uh, oh, yes. Um, so you said that operations on this table would be log in? Uh, searches of the linked lists are roughly log in. And what was your justification? I didn't give any. Uh, the justification is the mathematics of the balls in bins problem. It says that if you throw n items at random into n bins, then uh, almost all the time, the most heavily loaded bin, the one with the most balls in it, has around log n balls. Uh, and I cannot demonstrate that right now. But uh, I can probably dig up a reference for you if you want. That's, <coughs> but that's the answer. Is, is that the, the chance for the balls to cluster way more than that is is uh, infinitesimal? Uh, yeah. So I was curious about um, are there are there other methods uh, that are like how Perl and or Python are different than how Perl and Python do have <coughs> that are nearly equivalent. <coughs> For example, I'm wondering, I'm assuming JavaScript objects are hashes. I would think so, yeah. Um, is there, they are. Do they use a similar method to... Uh, I know nothing about the internals of JavaScript, I'm afraid. Okay. But, sorry, are, are there different methods other than these two that you've shown that are like nearly equivalent for the effectiveness of creating hash tables? Yeah, I think there's at least one other thing I didn't talk about that like, does the same thing. Okay. <coughs> It's okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to ask, uh, does Perl or Python use a, a random uh, number generator for their hash? No. No, they do not. Well, well, no, but yes, right? Because it is a complicated function. You put characters in one at a time, and it does a bunch of arithmetic. And the arithmetic it does is, if not identical to, very, very similar to the typical arithmetic of a typical pseudo random number thing. Like, okay. Uh, I mean, like literally the same. Uh, like, okay, well, we'll you know we'll do a shift, and then we'll like XOR this thing in, and it's just exactly the way a pseudo random number generator works. So, uh, did I say no? I meant yes. <laughs> uh, yes, please. Um, it's been a while since I've talked about it, but I remember Java. Like your hash function takes a certain amount of time. So 
you only have one thing in your two link, link, link list, it's probably faster to use a link list. Yeah, so, so here's the thing about, about data structures, right? The performance on small data, on like small amounts of data, is not important. Because no matter how you do it, it's going to be really fast. The only thing that matters is how does this perform on large amounts of data. Because for small amounts of data, it doesn't matter if you're using a like n squared or n log n or a linear time algorithm. Because they're all going to be like, OK, well, this one took a millimicrosecond, and this one took two microseconds. Oh my gosh, that one's twice as, twice as fast. Because <laughs> right? we live in a real world where time really elapses. And, right? Not the relative time doesn't matter in small time. So, um, you know, if it's small, it doesn't matter what you use. Right? And yeah, the list would be simpler, I guess. Uh, I don't know, you've got to try it. Because it's going to vary from computer to computer, from run to run. It's going to depend on the cache behavior. You know, at some point, there's going to be like some situation where the thing doesn't complete within 37 seconds. Your boss gets impatient and like storms off, right? But maybe you don't have that boss, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> the program doesn't know that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying not trying to make light of your question, but I'm, this is a serious answer. That, uh, that um, it doesn't matter. No, no, it, it might matter. But I can't answer that question because the reasons for which it will matter are not specified, and I don't know what they are. Uh, and that's that's my real answer. I'm sorry, I, I, I can't answer because I don't know enough. So long as you have I a pretty spinny like graphic, it doesn't matter how long it takes. <laughs> yeah. uh, what? So long as there's a pretty spinny graphic, it doesn't matter how long it takes. Larry Wall said that um, that the goal of Perl is uh, any program that you can it is successful if you can um, finish it before your boss fires you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something to that. All right, there was uh, some questions somewhere. Who has a question? Uh, yes. Um, do you know offhand with Perl and Python, like random number generators that are using the hash function are designed so that it's like hard to engineer collisions or? Yeah, um, I cannot remember when it was, but I could easily find out, at least for Perl, because I remember there was like a big thing about it, where like this, this, I'm trying to find the right word. I don't want to say doofus, because that's that's not what I'm trying to express. But okay, so there's this like, suddenly this thing blew up, and like, oh my gosh, you can attack the Perl hash function, and a web user can construct the keys so that you're a denial of service, and I'm like, you know, I pointed this out back in 1994, and it's really not a big deal. Like, nobody's ever actually done this. And, but they changed it around. Uh, Perl uh, generates a, a, a hopefully secure random number at the beginning of its run and then uses that to generate the hash function. Uh, it gets mixed into the hash function, so you really can't predict from one run to the next uh, where things are going to go. Uh, and that makes it literally impossible to, uh, to attack the hash. Must have been, I don't know, early 2000s, maybe? That's what I say whenever I don't know the answer to one. <laughs> I have about, uh, they have five more minutes, so I'm just standing here asking questions. Yes? Yeah, tickle, is tickle okay? What? Is tickle an okay thing to a command language? Is tickle okay what? What? Okay, that language Sorry, just speak up. That language does some interesting things, like tickle. regular expressions, at least that's one thing you can maybe do if they did anything interesting with hashing. I don't think so because my well, okay. So I my my knowledge of tickle is twenty years out of date at this point. Uh, and with that, maybe like so that bad. enormous caveat, my experience of tickle is that it was really underpowered and didn't have any serious data structures at all, much less hash. It didn't even have lists. And the way they told you how to do lists is, oh well, just concatenate them into a big string with spaces in between, which of course is a terrible answer. <laughs> And that I would like meet people like no that works fine and, no it doesn't but no that's what and like to increment a number it was stored as a string and then it would have to convert internally to a number do the integer arithmetic on it and then it would stringize it again and they thought this was okay because it's just a scripting language which is like a mistake that people have made so many times there's no excuse for it anymore that all scripting languages become programming languages. So it doesn't have to work, right? People don't even be writing little stuff in it. And then, <coughs> right, unless the language is so crappy that it collapses under its own weight when you try to do that. Uh, and with Tickle, boy, they sure tried hard. <laughs> uh, so uh, I hope I'm not like, making you feel bad about Tickle. But uh, no, no, no. Like, uh, Alright, so let's move it on. I have we have two minutes left or something? But right, let's 
Sometime we're going to get to Samana. Yeah, Samana. <laughs> All right, fine. Uh, I was confused by um, Me too. the number that was just, like this sort of six ish digit number. 142857. For instance, yes. Yeah. Um, where is that, is that is that stored? You said, oh, why, why throw that away? Which implies it was stored somewhere? Uh, yeah, so this is this is something I slipped into the slides after the test run this afternoon that I didn't really organize as well as I wanted it to. Um, but the idea is instead of just storing the key and the value, you also are going to store the hash that you computed. Yeah. Right? Because um, I assume it's an expensive computation too. So here's why. Let me there's a there's a really there's a really easy use case here. Suppose we hash up how one and we discover that how hashes to uh, something that is also equal to 9 when you modify 16, but it's different from that. You're going to come here, and now you need to find if how long is in this linked list. And, well, if you didn't have that, you'd have to do a string compare between Hamilton and, and, and Wong. And then you'd have to do a string compare on the next one. And it's much easier, instead of doing a string compare, which would take a lot of time, well, if you kept the hash value, you know Wong's number is, say, let's say it's, uh, let's say it's 25. Okay. Um, well, this is a 25, and you can calculate that in one instruction. But where is it stored? Uh, in another cell parallel to these two cells. Uh, you have, you know, you have a struct, and the struct has a pointer to the key and a pointer to the value and an integer where you stick the hash. Is that? I mean, it's, we're just doing boxes here, so just add another box. <laughs> That's how computer memory works. Are you being sarcastic? I'm not being sarcastic. I, I, I'm, I'm honestly puzzled by the question. I'm sorry. Okay, I think this might be a, I have to know C to understand this, but we can I don't think this. so. Oh, okay. Right, so you allocate a structure, and the structure has to have enough space in it to store two strings, which means two pointers, because that's what strings are at the low level. They're pointers to a place where the data really is. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's eight bytes. Right. Okay, well, don't allocate eight bytes. Allocate 12 bytes. Okay. Put the two pointers in the first eight bytes, and put this number in the other four bytes. All right, then. Is that clear? It's better. Okay, okay. Yeah. sorry. Thank you. Uh, all right, so uh, who's, all right, I don't have a question about you. Uh, so this is done in Perl or Python, this number thing that you're talking about? Uh, I know it's done in Perl, and I would be shocked if it weren't done in Python, because it's such an obvious optimization, and whatever Guido is, he's not wrong. I'm not foolish. Uh, I guess, <laughs> for me, it seems, it seems like a lot of choice, because this is something that should happen in frequent visualizations. No, they're not. No, they're not. So imagine you are, you are, you have 16 balls, and you draw six. You have a hat with 16 slips, number from one to 16, and you draw a slip at random, and you put the ball into that slot, and you draw 16 numbers. What are the chances that you are not going to get the same number twice? <coughs> right. I, I Several times. You, you have a limited number of buckets, but as far as my understanding, some of these things, as you add more, it will expand. It will expand. Right, like you said, you're going to go from 16 to 32, and whatever heuristic is in place that tries to counteract that. That's my. If, uh, if you kept that. if you kept the number of buckets vastly more than the number of ball of things in the buckets, then collisions would be unlikely. But that's a waste of memory. So you're trading off memory for time. <coughs> right, you and memory is cheaper than time. So that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Do you want the buckets to be as big as possible? I don't know. Maybe that make more sense. Uh, anyway, um, in practice, uh, whatever the trade-off is made differently, and um, there are invariably quite a lot of collisions. Uh, and it, because you can save a lot of collisions without actually slowing down the uh, the access time, it works. I looked it up a second ago. Python expands at the two-thirds full point. Two-thirds full. And huh. under fifty thousand elements, it expands by a factor of four. Above uh -huh. fifty thousand, it expands by a factor of two. Thank Is you. that in Red and Rhodes' The Mighty Dictionary? Uh, it was on Stack Overflow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised because of it two-thirds full, yeah. then you would expect not too bad. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I think we're out of time. All right. Can we take one more? One more hand. Let's take one more hand. Uh, oh wait, you already asked a question. You can ask me another time. All right. <laughs>